All right. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? What's going on? AO. Happy tax season. We are in the middle of it right now. It's late, late March. So um, if you haven't started thinking about doing your taxes, make sure you do them soon. Um, and for those who aren't aware, I'm a CPA. That's kind of what I do. So taxes is my thing. So I'm uh, running, running, running busy right now. All right, let me see. It's telling me I got some. I need to close some unused applications. Let me try to do that real quick as we get get a little smoother here. All right, let's get into some questions. All right, we got first up. We got Dan Bitter. Question is, we listed an IT developer as owning 3% of the company on our Chase business application, but I can't find any documentation of the equity split agreement. Does he legally own the 3%? Uh, business description and background to question. I'm a CTO of a tech startup with Todd, the CEO, and we have the majority of the equity. I bought another, brought another developer, Will, around January 2020 to help with a skill I didn't have and we'd, we agreed he, he'd receive 3% of equity. But I'm struggling to find anything signed that puts this in writing. It was definitely understood between all of us that he had 3%. This was referenced in a handful of emails and noted on our application for Chase business checking, savings, credit card accounts. I think, though, we never actually put together a document stating this. My initial equity agreement was the same 3%. And we would have made a copy with my name change change to wills my the only physical or electronic document i can find is the nda that will sign i'm guessing i never got around to finalizing things and he assumed it also talked about his equity uh it doesn't so unless there's a signed paper that will kept him unclear if he has a legal claim to the three percent equity he did good work that helped a ton but stepped away a year ago when his employment changed and isn't interested or able to join back up with us in a meaningful way Todd and I have made some great strides and we are preparing to find our first customers and investors and a non-participating 3% owner probably won't look great. I'd like to bring this to his attention and offer a lump sum for his efforts instead of keeping him on the team since his priorities don't appear to align with ours. I want to handle this professionally and respectfully without burning a bridge. Furthermore, am I focusing on this too much? This is my and Will's first startup and Todd's second. Is 3% worth this worry? Considering the likely dilution from potential angel VC investors and that only matters if we make money. All right. So I would say first and foremost, before I answer this question, absolutely 1,000 million percent talk with your attorney because this is absolutely an attorney question. Um, based on your operating agreement, based on what you actually have in writing, documentation, and everything. So, uh, absolutely talk with your attorney. That being said, from my understanding of corporate documentation, no one's an owner until you actually issue them stock or write them into membership in the LLC, depending on your agreement. And so, um, emails back and forth, uh, they constitute an intention, um, but, but, and, but you actually usually are supposed to put, and it depends on every, every state's a little different. Um, so I, I appreciate all the detail and everything that you shared. The best answer I can give is you've got, if you've got to find a good attorney, if you don't have one. You should have an operating agreement. You should have some sort of signed contract to get it in place. Now, some states have different rules that say if you've got it in an email in writing, it constitutes a contract. But there's got to be in most contracts, which in a, which giving someone 3% equity is a contract, there has to be something called consideration, which is exchange for the, for the value change. So, um, and again, like I said, I'm not an attorney. Um, this is definitely something you want to talk with your attorney about. Um, as far as it being worth the effort, 3% of the, a pre-revenue company obviously is worth a lot less than 3% of a company that goes and blows up and is worth $1 billion. 
Um, so right now, I think the best time to address it is right now before you try to go and blow it up. Because he's not going to care as much when there's nothing, no skin in the game, really, and no, nothing, no, really, no real benefit of him keeping that equity when it's not worth relatively anything compared to what it could be down the line. Um, once there's actual value on the table, then he's going to fight a lot harder to keep that, and your fight is going to be a lot more difficult. So um, I would definitely address it now rather than waiting until it becomes a bigger issue meaning it's going to cost you more to get him out. But I think you're correct on going out to angel and VC investors that having 3% already off the table um, would, I don't know if it hurt your investment chances, but they would certainly not like having that sort of wild card owner out there. Tiffany Rush, question, how do I develop centers of influence in my business? Uh, business description and background. I'm a new real estate agent and I've heard that developing centers of influence will build your business by having the right kind of people to surround yourself with. Uh, first off, I will say that is absolutely correct. Second, high level, the strategically and conceptually what you want to do to develop centers of influence is you want to figure out ways to add value to those centers of influence. And the idea is you want to get them to refer you business. And so the human brain is engineered to perform reciprocally. So if you're wanting referrals to come your way and introductions to come your way, the easiest and simplest way to do that is to send Find, find those centers of influence and figure out ways to send introductions and referrals their way. Because if you do that, then they're going to start, and they should at least, they should start sending you referrals back. And, and so, and if they don't, and you start sending them 5, 10, 20 introductions, and they send you nothing back over a course of a few months, then it at least gives you an opportunity to say, hey, how are those... How are those introductions working out? Are those valuable to you? And by the way, you know, I haven't noticed that you've sent anything my way. You know, what can I do to, to possibly be someone that you send introductions to? But that's the best way is add value and do it in a way that you want do unto others as you'd have done to yourself. Same thing. So if you can find a way to increase their bottom line, then they're gonna most likely, if they're any good at what they do, and if they're a center of influence, then they probably understand the business. Then they will reciprocate in that way. And if you don't have introductions to send to them, then figure out other ways you can add value. Maybe you can just you know, share, share what they're doing or you can help them in some way or you can you know, just, I don't know, find a way to add value to them uh, to just to be top of mind when they think that when they come across someone who needs, needs help in a way that, that you can help. Colin Jarvis Gong, um, question, what are some good places to look for investment? VC lists, accelerators, etc. cetera. Uh, what exactly should I prepare to show potential investors? Uh, pitch deck, metrics. Um, business description and background. Palmates app is an app that connects dog owners near each other, like Tinder. I've had some initial traction on news spots and 10,000 downloads in four months. I'm working hard on branding thanks to a discussion with Sean, but need some guidance on funding and where to find it. Um, so good places. I would just, the more people you can meet, the more people and, and just talk about what you're doing, the better. That's going to get you, if you can join groups like this, other business groups where there's entrepreneurs getting out there. I know people are always looking to find places. Cash is trash right now. And the stock market's incredibly overvalued. Real estate's crazy. Uh, but there's the, I was just at a, a big finance event a couple weeks ago. And they were like the, and people were going through their portfolios. Alternative investments are becoming a bigger and bigger piece of people's portfolios. And what you're offering is um, an alternative investment. And so, so 
I would just get out there and meet as many people as possible, start hanging in groups. I know that um, there's a lot of, back when I was in business school, there were a lot of um, business school classes where angels came in, they were trying to give back and they would let you pitch. And so I don't know, I'm not saying go get a business degree, but camp, college campuses are a great place where those types of people are hanging out looking to give back. So it might be a great way if you can go and get connected with alumni boards or alumni organizations. As far as what to prepare to show potential investors, um, you know, go watch a few episodes of Shark Tank. The, um, they, they're always, you know, kind of asking similar questions that investors are looking at. Um, I just did a webinar with Damon John uh, for yesterday, actually, speaking of Shark Tank. Um, and um, the other thing that I've noticed as a common thread of a lot of really good investors, what they've told me they're looking for is they're not looking to bet on the horse. They're looking to bet on the jockey. And the jockey is the owner. So the horse is the business concept, the business idea. Whereas the jockey is if they want to bet on the owner because the owner has shown a proven track record of getting things across the finish line uh, and, and building success. So if there's anything you can do to prove not just your metrics, that's going to be critical. What's, you know, what's your profit margins? What's your, your cost? Like what's, what's your audience? What, what, what is your differentiator? Uh, what is the value of the market that you're in? Um, but then more importantly, what can you prove that's shown that you yourself, Colin, has a proven track record of success? That's going to help as much or more than any metrics that you can prove from your audience. Because there's a whole bunch of people out there trying to pitch themselves when they're, you know, quote, pre-revenue. But um, if you can show that you are, um, you are a, a jockey worth betting on, that's going to go a long way. I don't know why my, my there we go, the, the level of the, uh, the camera is a little, a little crooked. <laughs> uh, all right. Joshua Grant. Question. When do I need to stop outsourcing and buy the tools and machines to do it in-house? Business description and background. I'm a welding and fabrication business that fabricates a lot of metal products. Our products are powder coated. This is a better way of painting that lasts a lot longer if done correctly. My problem is it's taking a lot longer to get my parts done. Two weeks. And I feel it's hurting my cash flow. A project that we can finish in a week. Then take the powder coat, wait two weeks, and then install the liver. Then wait to get paid. The company that does this service is just getting larger. In the past, it would take them three to five days. The equipment cost is around $75,000 for turnkey. Last year, I spent $20,000 with them. How can I calculate the ROI if, make, if I make the investment to bring in-house and what else should I take into consideration? So first off, what I would look at if it's a cash flow timing issue, can you change the terms with your customers so that you collect a deposit up front so that you're not waiting to get paid until all the back end. That would fix the cash flow issue without having to make a significant investment in a new equipment if these if these uh, if your vendor is taking a little bit longer. On the other side of the business of just straight up making the decision to invest in the equipment versus off, outsourcing it. I would look at a couple things. I would look at number one, what's your true cost of doing it yourself? So it's not just buying the equipment. It's also, do you have to, I'm sure they're paying people to do the work. So what do you have to do? Who would you have to hire to do the work? So what's your total true cost of owning that equipment and bringing it in house? So that's the extra cost side of things. On the extra benefit side of things, what you want to look at is you mentioned a project can take that you can finish takes a week. Whereas because you're outsourcing it, from what I'm understanding, it's taking basically two to three weeks. So if, if you can do a project in-house that's a week versus three weeks, then that means by bringing it in-house, you're tripling your capacity. 
So if you have to, in, it, 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 so it's going to depend on what's an average project and how much faster can you turn it around. So let's say if you're taking three weeks per project, in 50 weeks a year, you're turning around 17 projects. So if you charge 10,000, if you make $10,000 per project and you're getting 17 done in a year, that's $170,000 of revenue you're able to generate. If now you're able to turn it around in a week, so you're now doing 52 projects a year at, at an average project of $10,000, now you're generating $520,000 of revenue per year. Just on the, I don't, so I don't know what your average project is, but in that example, you're going from $17,000 a year to $520,000 a year. That's an extra $350,000 of revenue. You have to invest $75,000 of equipment to get $350,000 of extra revenue. That's a four times plus, you know, more than four times return on your investment. So that's a good reason to invest in, in buy that equipment. So I would look at number one on the the front end, can you change your uh, can you change your payment terms to speed up cash flow? And on the back end, what's the average per project and how much time are you gonna speed up the project? I wouldn't look at it at what you're paying them. I want to look at how much more revenue can you produce because you're turning it around faster and able to generate more sales. And that's the true ROI on making that investment. Hey, Rosalie. Hi, Jennifer. Quay Sturdy. Question. Uh, when would you consider protecting IP, intellectual property? As I create more forms and systems to enhance my services, I've had the thought around copyright and trademarks. I feel as though all the forms I am making will set me apart from competition. I would love to be able to license out all these systems and processes when I hit that level. That way I can help others operate better companies while getting another revenue stream. Not sure if this is common practice with small businesses. I figured it's worth an ask. Thanks. So again, this is a great question for an IP attorney. So I will caveat it with that. But what I'm hearing you're saying is what you're, what you're wanting to trademark or copyright is your internal systems and processes. And with my limited knowledge of IP, those aren't necessarily external things to copyright. Those are what are called trade secrets. And so you want to make sure you have a, a contract with your employees that you bring on that all trade secrets are confidential. Um, but as far as as working on and spending time, energy, and effort on comp, on on copywriting your systems and processes, um, I would say build your business to the point, and then and then maybe document those, and then talk with an attorney at the point that you're maybe a couple months from wanting to license that out to make sure you're protecting yourself on that. But I would, I would caution you to not necessarily spend the time, energy, and actual hard dollars if it's just internal systems and processes. Now, if you're spending a lot of time and energy and actual manpower hours on those systems and processes, I would look at Depending, I don't know how big your team is, but I would look at getting an, an R&D tax credit or a research and development tax credit. So if you spend hard costs or spend significant wage dollars in time on updating and evolving your systems and processes, you can actually get credits against your taxes on that. So I would actually focus on looking at that as an option over spending money for copywriting and trademarking your systems and processes right now. And then when you're at the point where you want to go license that, then let's talk on spending some money with an attorney on, on how to do that. So that's that's where the order of operations that I'd look at in terms of the priorities on that. Grant Elliott, question. 
What's the ideal CRM software for us to track a setter's leads? Who's done a call, who hasn't, whether they converted or need a follow-up, et cetera. Um, also, best financial qualification strategy. Business description and background. Online low-back rehab coaching program, hiring telemarketers, salespeople, and want to track data and sales processes. Um, so I'm going to give you the, the holy grail of CRM softwares, you are going to go, oh my gosh, Tyler, you're a genius. I've been waiting all life, all my life for this. This is worth 10 years of accelerators organization dues because you're going to get the tool that you need to have your ideal CRM software. Are you ready? So the best CRM software, you're going to go, you're going to go out and get this right now. The best ideal CRM software for you to track all of your sales pipeline is the one that you use. That's it. I can give you a no, you know, there's Salesforce, HubSpot, um, Infusionsoft, there's industry specific CRMs, but the best CRM, I'm gonna bring it up close, is the one you use. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to get people to implement CRMs or, and we've changed CRMs that we've gone through and, and they, we just use it for a week and then you get distracted and then you just stop using it. So I would just look at one that's reasonably affordable, um, but you know, even if it's an Excel spreadsheet, whatever it is, use it. That's, that's the best ideal CRM software that you're going to use. Uh, personally, we, I, we've used a lot of different CRMs, so I don't know that I'm the best to answer this in terms of softwares. I'd say one that has, a, as far as features, you want one that has a pipeline to track so you can see that. Um, we recently converted over to HubSpot, and that seems to be working pretty well and has an actual sales pipeline. Um, Salesforce is sort of the, the industry standard, but it is also... It's inexpensive on the surface, but there's a lot of programming costs and expense on the back end to maintain it and do it the right way. Um, if Fusionsoft is cheap, um, but I would say, you know, find, pick one and, and use it. Um, and that's, that's what I would say. So, uh, Jacqueline Lepsch, question. Should I be collecting sales tax from every state on my Wix website. Uh, background, I started selling homemade, vegan, and cruelty-free cosmetics pro products online a month ago, uh, based in Massachusetts, and I only sell within the United States. I collect sales tax from Mass Re Massachusetts residents, but I'm still I'm not sure if I should be collecting sales tax from other states as well. I believe when I did some research on it, stated you should if you were making 200 plus sales a year or have certain dollar amounts per year that you are making, but I still found it confusing and hard to understand. If it helps, I made 50 plus sales in my first month. Well, hey, great job on that. Uh, so sales tax is a is a, a big beast right now. And the, there's a, a, a court case that came out, it's been a couple years ago now, but this is basically that changed the way that sales tax had to be reported. And frankly, we small CPA firms aren't touching it with a 10 foot pole especially if you're doing e-commerce. Um, so I would say on your Wix website is gonna be, you're gonna have to figure out manually. I know like Amazon is handling it for their third-party sellers themselves. So that would be if you sell through and get an Amazon shop, that's a great way to, to handle it the right way. What I would look at is a company that does sales tax exclusively and they have platforms that do it. So like one is Avalara is a company that focuses on sales tax right now. I've heard mixed mixed reviews on their how their customer service is, but I know they are solely focused on sales tax. Uh, so I'd, I'd start there, see how that works. But the way that it works with sales tax is every state and every municipality has different rules in terms of those sales thresholds for what cri uh, what cr qualifies as you need to file with them. So. Um, so that's why it's very diff a very difficult beast to handle. And so that's why I'd focus, work with a company that does pretty much sales tax exclusively. 
and uh, and and set up a portal through them because it's a it's a it's it's quite the project getting the sales tax done. I would not recommend trying to figure it out yourself. Kristen Lander, is there a threshold for percentage of revenue that we take home that we should aim to stay within? Business description and background. As I scale my coaching company, I'm paying out about 46% of revenue to my 1099 contractors and about 15% commission to partnerships with other businesses. This means I'm retaining as low as 39% of revenue with clients brought in on partnerships before expenses, uh, which right now are fairly low, but doesn't leave much room for me to hire admin until I've significantly increased my profits. Is this just the normal part of the process or should I be considering changing something as I continue to scale and bring on more contractors and partners? My prices are already high at the high end in my industry. So raising prices right now probably isn't a good solution. Yeah, so bottom line after all expenses, it varies industry by industry, but you wanna shoot for somewhere between 10 and 20%. Once you start getting above, and that's after admin, everything. So if there's not enough margin before paying all your admin and operating costs, then you need to either renegotiate with your partners or figure out a way to, to, to like you said, if prices, if there's, if there's price pressure, then you're going to have to figure out other ways where it's got to give. But somewhere between 10 and 20% profit margins, depending on your industry, once you hit 20 to 25%, that means you're rocking it, but it probably means it's not sustainable, meaning you're either running too lean or you're in an industry where it's going to soon get flooded because there's, there's, that means there's a lot of profit in the industry. If it's below 10%, uh, that means that you're not operating effectively or sustainably. And so somewhere in that 10 to 20% margin and if you need to renegotiate with your partners, then, and that's before paying owners a dime after all expenses. So that's not your, your cost of the product, that's all net income and net operating income. Michael Wilding, question, what would I need to put in place to help prevent infringement of my intellectual property from a new competitor on the market? Business description and background of question. I own a ticketing platform for selling event tickets. I'm looking to get my website reprogrammed with a new programming language. Um, So that, again, I would talk with an intellectual property attorney to figure out what makes the most sense on that. I would also plan on if you build any sort of brand online or have any sort of success, Maybe not on the back end of the programming side of things, but anything you put on your website, expect it to get ripped off. I can't tell you how many people post the same tax content that I posted, and it it almost looks word for word similar to what I wrote in my original post. Um, And so anything that is just out there, expect it to get ripped off, and you can try to protect it, but it's going to be very difficult to do so. Um, on the back end, on the programming side of things, talk with an attorney and figure out what you can do to, to you know, prevent yourself from, uh, from an intellectual property standpoint. That would be my best answer. I know that's, that's come up a couple times on, on this call in terms of IP. Um, it's so unique, all the IP rules in every state and in every industry and in different types of IP that you just... You've got to talk with an attorney about that for your specific situation. Joe Nugent. Question. What am I allowed and and not allowed to do with a 1099 independent contractor as far as providing computers, company phone, etc.? Business description and background of question. I own a home inspection and home watch company in Naples, Florida. In order to grow, I need to meet more realtors. I'm bringing onto my team a telemarketing position. They will be classified as a 1099 team member. Am I allowed to give them a company phone and or laptop or do they need to use their own since they're a 1099? This new position will allow me to be introduced to several hundred uh, hundred a week. So I'm assuming that means 700 people contacts a week. 
Elevator pitch. I work with people buying a home to inspect it prior to closing to ensure that the home is safe and all systems and components are working properly. I also work with seasonal residents to look after their slice of paradise. All right, so the big thing with 1099s is they've gotta be truly independent. So just because you provide them with equipment doesn't mean they're not independent. So all you need to do with that is write into the contract if you're hiring that, you're, that the, their, their contract says you provide me with equipment and then you do that. Um, you can say that you still own the equipment, but you're providing, with, providing it for them for their use. The key there is, is, is less around the equipment that you're providing. It's more around kind of uh, direction of duties and time and calendar management. So if you're telling them to follow a set process or you're telling them they have to be at their desk making phone calls from, for, you know, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day, then that's when you get into employee uh, criteria. If you're saying, I'm paying you per appointment that you're setting, then that's independent contractor. So it's more about how you set and how you set the contract and how you pay them and their calendar than it is the equipment that you're, you're sending to them. Now, that equipment can be a factor if, if the other items are starting to stack and then the, the and then so you're setting their calendar and you're paying them an hourly rate and you provide them equipment and it starts to stack then you may be getting into more gray area so that that's a factor but it's not a major differentiating and deciding factor on the 10 to 9 versus employee relationship All right, Ricardo Delgado how can I switch my business from paying 1099 contractors to making them employees? Um, business description and background. I own a barbershop and I want to start paying the contractors as employees. Can I still pay them a commission-based pay? Or is the way I can pay them a salary then add commissions on top of their pay? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's as simple as literally you set up a payroll, payroll service and you start running payroll and running their income through payroll. And that's pretty much it. You can absolutely pay them a base pay plus commissions. Um, and usually if you use a payroll provider, like we use Gusto, G-U-S-T-O, you can use QuickBooks Payroll, you can use ADP, you can use Paychex. There's all kinds of payroll providers out there. Um, and usually there's a line for hourly pay, there's a line for uh, salary pay, there's a line for commissions pay, there's a line for bonuses pay. And so you just set those up and then you just add their commissions into their paycheck based on what it is and based on what your agreement is each to each pay period. And so you can absolutely pay commissions through W2s. And uh, it's as simple as just you set up, get your get a payroll tax ID number and set up a payroll a service with a payroll provider and start paying payroll. And that's pretty much how it works. All right, that is all the questions. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we will see you on the next call. Talk to you later. Have a good, uh, good rest of your day.